Today, I'm speaking with Aaron Ra. Aaron, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. How you do? Absolutely. I'm doing great. And it's it's really good to have you here on the channel. I've been an admirer from a distance for quite a while, and it is an absolute honor and a privilege to speak with you. So thank you so much for giving me your time today. And just for a quick bio, uh, Aaron lives in Texas, but he's from Arizona originally. Uh, he's a YouTuber, of course, at Aaron Ra. I'll have the link beneath this video. Please go like and subscribe and check out all of his great work. He is the director at the Phylogeny Explorer Project. He also studied at Arizona State University and studying at the School of Human Evolution and Social Change. He is the former president of the Atheist Alliance of America, and he has over 60 pet snakes, which is awesome and amazing. Uh, so tell us more about your snakes and anything else we can know about you. Huh. Well, a little over a year ago, my, my wife decided that she wanted to attack her aphidophobia head on. Because uh, when, when we met, I had I had snakes then. I had a couple of snakes only. And she couldn't look at them. I mean, she, she no, not even look at them. And at one point, I had to hand her a ball python while I was doing something with its enclosure. And I could see her visually vibrating and holding the snake because it, it was pushing her limits so much. But then uh, I think there was, a, there was an incident uh, in the Midwest at some point last year where she she screamed when she saw a snake in the grass and and jumped up on a stoop and everything and everybody's calming her down it's like out here you're gonna see snakes in the in the suburbs you know you but they're gonna be there be to be garter snakes or corn snakes or milk snakes or whatever it's not gonna be you know something dangerous and I think I think she got a little bit embarrassed about that about having a I don't know a weakness a susceptibility so she went out and bought a snake and then another one. And then oh. another one. And then <laughs> that's awesome. You really got and acclimated. Pretty soon after we had like a dozen of them, she decided that, hey, maybe we should breed some of these. Mm. So she started building up a collection and I have snakes again. Will you would you ever consider getting uh, a snake that's uh, really dangerous? Would I consider it? Yeah. Yeah, I would. Um I have considered it two or three uh I'm, I'm not right now i'm I, i'm we're discussing i want to i wanted to get a copperhead hmm. but it's a. Uh, I have looked at a couple of of actual dangerous ones i mean i have a friend a, a good friend in virginia who has 40 snakes and he has a lot of vipers and elapids he's got um he's got cobras and bush adders and all of that sort of thing and and so I wanted to get a copperhead to to help me with the the hook and tail training, you know, and how to handle a hot snake. I have two or three mild. Well, I think I got four or five now, mildly venomous snakes. And we were at, it, where the, the the venom isn't going to kill you, but they are venomous. And we were just holding another one. Oh, I wish I could remember the species name. We were just holding it yesterday, and we were warned that it's mildly venomous and cantankerous. But getting it out of the cage, just letting it run through our fingers and everything, and then it's uh, it's it's fine. It, it never, mm. it, it's very fast. It's quick. It's flighty, but it it uh, it wasn't bitey. It never, it didn't get it. Mm. I remember years ago, a friend of a friend that was uh, did snake breeding, and he was telling me he had a a boa constrictor that slept in a cage at the foot of his bed, and I thought oh, I could not do it. <laughs> could not do it. I have a seven foot boa constrictor imperator. Um, in the bottom enclosure behind me, and he's out right now. Hmm. Uh, the one just above that is a six foot uh, uh, false water cobra, and then I have uh, well, I've got a, I've got actually a few boas. I have a baby over here, a baby uh, boa constrictor oxalatus, and that one is going to be give it her a decade. She's going to be enormous. She's going to be at least ten feet long. This this is a species that can get up to eighteen feet long, but typically gets at least ten feet long, and so she's wow. going to probably be my my biggest or at least my heaviest snake. And then over here in this cabinet, I've got another false water cobra, a breeding pair of Russian rat snakes, and in the bottom, I've got a baby again, a baby reticulated python. Hmm. And so he will probably be sixteen feet long, and but but he won't weigh as much as the other one. I think I'd be I'd, at the moment, at least I'm more of the lines of where your wife used to be with getting the heebie jeebies being around snakes, you know, like that. But I, I probably need to get used to them too. We, we've, we've really crossed a threshold with that. 
Uh, mm-hmm. They are more like puppies to me now. Yeah. It's hard for me to imagine that if people having this. I, I, I get that people have a fear of it, but I know I've watched my wife make the transition from being afraid to even look at them to honestly adoring them. Mm-hmm. And if we see one get hurt, if we see one get killed unnecessarily, our heart breaks for it. Mm-hmm. So we have a lot of empathy and sympathy yeah. for these animals now. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Well, in terms of uh, the, the big reason we're here today, of course, I do want to give you a chance to share your story. What I do on the channel um, is just I invite people to share their stories in terms of how their Christian worldview shaped and you know what what things were you taught growing up and what things did you believe and adhere to and just how did it change and eventually you know I'd love to kind of get to the story of you know what what radical changes occurred that took you to the place you are today. So feel free to tell us the, you know where you're coming from world with your worldview. Well, sure. Um, I was baptized Mormon. Um, but I was, uh, my family at least had this practice that I know most Mormons don't practice this, but my family fortunately did saved me. Uh, they had this thing where you, you don't indoctrinate your kids until they reach the age of reason, eight years old. So they didn't teach their religion until I was in second grade. Hmm. And on my eighth birthday, my mother very excitedly comes in with a Bible lesson. Happy birthday. Let's read the Bible. At eight, where she's telling me that this is the absolute truth and the revealed word of God and all that shit. But by then, I had already seen, you know, I was already in second grade. I'd already seen dinosaur books. One of my teachers had actually given me a dinosaur book that had a cladogram in it. So I was able to see a phylogenetic chart of living things and see how everything you know places together which is a concept that it's the strongest evidence for evolution there is it was the first evolution evidence there was i mean this is the thing that in in 1735 carolus linnaeus tries to classify all living things and he realizes that they're not in a in a form of created kinds like he thought they should be they're in a nested hierarchy the, the, of of daughter groups within you know a, a progressive lineage of ancestral groups, mm-hmm. enveloping parent categories where each one uh, produces at least two daughter sets, and from those two is four and eight and sixteen, thirty two, and so on. And the way that uh, it, in general it's not always even like that, but I mean the, the the thing is is he couldn't explain that. This is he was looking at a family tree. And unable to explain how, because he believed in God, he believed in creation. He he had no concept of evolution, so he had this dilemma: How is this a a familial hierarchy? This th- th- there's got to be an explanation. And so what he realized is that you know he believed that uh, change was possible within a species what they call microevolution but there was no change between species macroevolution so you couldn't evolve new species and then of course a hundred years later darwin says well actually look that natural selection will get you new species and so he wrote this book called on the origin of species wherein he addressed you know the linnaean dilemma of course, Linnaeus never knew that answer. He, he he was mystified by what he was looking at. So I, I was aware of this. Uh, not all of that, of course, but I mean, at least I had a better concept than Linnaeus did. Uh, and so when my parents came in and said, you know, here, read the Bible, read Genesis, and and this is all absolute truth, my my immediate response on first reading was, no, it isn't. Look what it says here. Mm-hmm. I mean, I wasn't a doctor. I, I wasn't inculcated i wasn't conditioned emotionally conditioned that you must believe this and that you must you must put out of mind anything that contradicts that because you can stunt a child's intellectual development when you would you fill them with this kind of thing did you have to believe that it becomes a matter of your identity that you have a self-defense mechanism that anything that challenges our literal interpretation of this you have to react as if as if your life is being threatened as if it's going to change who you are this is the only reason we still have religion is because of that that my family failed to do the the core thing that all you, you everybody's supposed to do when you indoctrinate 
the old Jesuit saying about, you know, give me a child until he is seven and I will show you the man. Hmm. And some people never develop that, that ability to, for critical thinking. Once it's been stunted in the formative years, a lot of people never get it back. When you were so uh, critically thinking at that age, was your family upset and saying, no, 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 we need to steer them back to the faith? How did they respond? <laughs> they weren't very good at it. So my family were not philosophers. My family were not scientists. They had no respect for academics at all. And they didn't understand their own scriptures. I mean, these are these are people that, there are people in my family who have, have told me that they're 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 better than me because they're Christian. Now you may be on your fourth marriage and your fourth felony conviction as a drug addicted alcoholic fornicator who's never cracked open a Bible, doesn't care what it says, and doesn't know what a creed is, but you say you're Christian, so that makes you Christian and that makes you better than me. And that's really all it is. You just say that you're a Christian. You say that you believe whatever other people tell you that the Bible says, because you ain't reading the damn thing. So it's just fantastic mm -hmm. hypocrisy. And then the, the way my dad put it was, why well, just believe in the man upstairs? Really? Mm -hmm. So was, you so never... You never they, did, they didn't know anything about theology. I mean, they didn't. They, they were. They weren't able to teach the faith. I mean, everything that my mother said, trying to teach me, she was alone in this. Hmm. But everything she tried to teach me was just wackaloon crap. You know, it was all stuff. It was all stuff that I, as a, as a child and a and a young teenager, I knew better than everything she was saying. And so every time she spoke to me about her religious beliefs, it was always an argument. I mean, from eight eight years old on, mm. I would I would question things like when she tells me that uh, everything everything is for a reason. Like uh, like there, there's nothing that, that that nothing accidental. Everything happens for a reason. Every there, every feature of your body was there by design. And I remember bringing up aspects of the body that didn't make any damn sense. You know, uh, why is this here? And what's the purpose of that? Of course, you can't give me an explanation for that. Why do dogs have dew claws? You know, all of all of that. I mean, there's no explanation. You, you just tell me that there's a reason. And she would tell me the, um, what Satan wants. And I remember that this is like, this is too simplistic a description for this character. I need to know its motivation. What is Satan? Why does Satan want our souls? What's he going to get out of that? And there's nobody can explain anything. Fuck all, anything. So I'm a little kid, and every question is being dodged or averted. When I was, uh, was I 11? I think I was 11. And they didn't take me to church a lot. I remember being in primary school a couple of times. Yeah, it, the, the, the primary school teacher. This was like 1970, 71. And she wanted to lead the class in a song. She's going to have all the children sing. This is the first day I'm in primary school. So we're all going to sing Joy to the World and a one and a two. And in 1971, one of the top 40 songs was Joy to the World by Three Dog Night. But it is not the same George of the World that they wanted us to sing in class. So I belt out, Jeremiah was a bullfrog, and everybody looks at me like I'm insane. Because they were not awesome. of the world. You know, and I was living mostly in Los Angeles at that time. So, I mean, I was I would flip back and forth between L.A. and you know, rural Arizona, where my grandparents lived. And it was... It was confusing and awkward. But they took me to... They took me to a church one Easter, 1971. And I never went again. Um, the, the, there was a, the guy behind the podium was talking about how there was a riverbed in Texas that, where there was human footprints found walking alongside dinosaurs, and so I'm my my mind is reeling. I'm I'm like, and and he said that this happened six thousand years ago. So my thought right away is we're talking about pre-Columbian Native Americans. 
walking with some what is it this cryptozoology thing maybe like a like a last race of iguanodons or something but but you know that that died out you know thousands of years ago along with the woolly mammoth or whatever well it's fascinating to me i thought that was exciting news to hear and he goes on that they they found these uh these sandal print footprints and i'm thinking you know, native americans didn't wear sandals they were moccasins moccasins wouldn't leave a print like that and there were things that were not making sense and so then the scientist says, or the scientist, no, the preacher says, and that these footprints walking alongside dinosaurs 6,000 years ago proves those were Adam's footprints. And my 11-year-old mind thought, there's no way that you could identify the owner of a pair of shoes by a shoe print. And if you can't know something and you're, you're claiming to know something you don't know, there's no way you can know that. We call that lying. Now, it took me a while to realize that that's all religion does. That's that's the thing religion does. Pretend to know things you don't know. That's what faith is all about. That's what every religion does. Assert baseless speculation as if it was a matter of fact. Lie. That's That's what that is. I, I later discovered it more recently. I, I discovered a quote from Abraham Lincoln that, I, that, that uh, beautifully sums that up. He says, it is an established maxim in morals that he who makes an assertion without knowing whether it is true or false is guilty of falsehood. And the accidental truth of the assertion does not justify or excuse him. So when they say something's true that they have no way of knowing it's true, and then they turn around and say, well, you can't prove that it isn't, does, I don't have to. If you can't show justification for the bullshit claim you just made, it's exactly the same as when you make up statistics out of your head. Yeah. If you're pulling shit out of your ass, you're making it up. It's still a lie. Even if you roll the dice and it turns out that the thing you said was correct, doesn't matter. It was still a guess and you stated it as fact. You're still a liar. That's religion. In a nutshell. So making did you ever... shit up and lying about it. Did you ever fear hell then at all, or you did you? My did family you wasn't part of it. My family wasn't big on hell. Fortunately, okay. we did we didn't have a lot of that damnation shit because you know, Mormons typically don't. Okay, you know, they're 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 more interested in whether they're going to get their own planet or not. So it's it's That's more awesome. about that than whether whether there's damnation. It's the other religious denominations that are worried about the damnation. So I didn't have that, and. When I did in middle school, uh, I I followed some cute girl home because she asked me to to walk her home, and she's cute, and I'm twelve, and I'm okay, well, good, twelve or thirteen, and I my, I follow this girl home at her request, and and it turned out that her family was using her. They had a plan that she was supposed to go out and be the bait to draw boys to the house where the family could then proselytize at other people's children. So I get into the house and there's, you know, dad and grandma and siblings and all that, and everybody's around and it's all nice and polite for about 30 seconds before they launch into their speaking in tongues, madness, screaming into the face of a 13 year old boy that any minute now, 1976, any minute now, the world will be engulfed in flames and they they're going to disappear and i will be and i will be in a lake of fire and i remember crying not at anything that they were saying and not not at any possible potential truth to what they're saying because there isn't any i remember crying because i just stepped into a madhouse these people are out of their fucking mind all of them, the whole room, full of full of adults who are clearly insane. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, when I was a kid, I would people people Amazing. would ask me, you know, what is your religion? And when they asked that question, every time they asked that question, I knew there was going to be a problem. Because if if my religion matters to you, then then there's going to be a problem. If, if that's important to you, there's going to be a problem. And I would always answer, well, my family is Mormon, and I think there's a pretty obvious comma there, and and, and it, it would seem to me that the next word is probably going to be the word but, right? Because I never identified as Mormon, because I didn't know 
whether I believed everything necessary to be a Mormon. Uh, and like not only that, but I'm, 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 a, I'm a kid. I mean, I haven't studied any other religions. I don't know anything about them. So how would I know whether one of them might resonate with me more? Once I study them all, I might find one that clicks. And, you know, indeed, I eventually I did. If I had if I had read the Tao Te Ching before watching Star Wars, I would have I would have identified as a Taoist. But instead, I I heard Obi-Wan Kenobi first. And so I was my honest, my honest spirituality in my teen years from 77 uh, on was Jedi. Mm. That's amazing. That's sincerely what i believed hmm. the force is an energy field that created by all living things surrounds us penetrates us binds the galaxy together in the book it went on and said that uh, if you can control it to a point but it in turn controls you like trying to control the waves of an ocean and so george lucas based jedi on a combination of confucianism and taoism so when i went when i read the Tao Te Ching eventually. I came to this passage, my favorite line out of the book, which was that nature acts without intent and so cannot be said to be benevolent nor malevolent to anything. And I don't know why, but I just, I found that beautiful. Mm, awesome. But it is essentially, that's that's the Jedi religion. Yeah. I got to say, I'm, I'm a little bit jealous of the fact that you were so able at, at such a young age to really see past it all because... Um, like my story only because my parents were incompetent at, at proselytizing yeah and in and indoctrination they didn't know what they were doing and that, that makes all the difference <laughs> in the world it really does i mean that's that's because like you said they're trying to get them while they're young but i mean for me i i um i did not even begin to escape till i was in my early 40s um realizing i'm teaching my kids the stories of the conquest of canaan and the genocide the land theft and all that bad stuff pricked in my conscience as it were for the first time in my life that I'm not sure I should be passing this on. And yet I fully believe it all it took me about three years to th process that. And then about four years ago from, from today, it just suddenly hit me. I was like, Oh my gosh, like this, this none of this is real. Like it's never been real. And it just yeah. it blew my mind. And I was out, I was out in a day, out in an hour, um, never looked back. But when you, once you get out, you're like, oh my gosh, like, what was I in? How did I believe that for so long? And it just, it, I, I say this jokingly a lot on my channel, but like, even th there's so many things we could list of like reasons to not believe this book, but even like something as simple and low key as saying, there's a God who commands people to cut off the end of little boy's penises. It's like, that's, there's, you know, we're talking about genocide, there's much bigger issues on the table, but but that alone is like, that's really weird. And then the other one I point to a lot is the Lord's table. Like you, you literally every month or every few weeks, you would go up to this table and pretend to eat the the body and, the, and drink the blood of a dead man. And like, that never seemed weird to you. Not once for 40 mm -hmm. years, but it's like, that's what indoctrination does. It gets you so bad. So when you study other religions, and you realize because these are not things you grew up with. You realize how how ridiculous is this? How bizarre? How can how can anybody be so stupid as to believe this? And then you have to reflect. I mean, because Christians do this all the time when they hear about what Hindus believe or what they hear about what Sikhs believe. You don't get very far into reading anybody else's scriptures. I mean, just just like page one, you're like, this is bullshit. Yeah, but you you don't notice that. Yours has a talking snake. <laughs> what? How did you overlook that? <laughs> exactly. But you so well, I had a bigger problem in that I was not the skeptic that you you might think that I am, because not my yeah my parents were not very good at at indoctrination, so I was never Mormon. But uh, I spent a good deal of my childhood in Los Angeles in the late sixties. So L.A. in the late 60s and early 70s was a very different environment. It was a very spiritual thing. Every time he went to the airport, he was full of Hare Krishnas and all of that. Um, I had, by the time I was 16, I had read The Science of Self-Realization by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Uh, I, I, had, uh, I, had, I had dabbled in all kinds of, uh, of, of extra 
extra biblical woo. I believed everything necessary to be a Ghostbuster. I remember when the movie Ghostbusters came out and Janine says, do you believe in spirit photography, full trans mediums, astral projections, a Loch Ness monster, the theory of Atlantis, all that shit. I believed in all of it. Every bit of it. Completely credulous. Now, I didn't believe biblical stories like ever. I, I knew those were parables of one kind or another. That, that you know, that, that when it says this, it really means that kind of thing. Uh, I, and I, I had these interpretations for what uh, what Genesis means. I mean, the, like the, the the tree of knowledge of good and evil versus the tree of eternal life. Obviously, this is a parable. These are not trees that you can cut down and build a canoe. You know, but my my parents or my grandparents freaked the fuck out when I gave my interpretation of what this means because. As my grandpa put it, well, then what is the meaning of life? I'm like, meaning of life? What kind of stupid question is that? There's no meaning to life. It struck me as like when the, the old stereotype of the fortune teller who casts the chicken bones or the tea leaves or shuffles the tarot cards, all of these are meant to be totally random. And then you pretend to read what they mean, right? Well, that's that is as absurd as like as asking what is the meaning of life there's no fucking meaning if you want your life to mean something you got to figure out what it is and then work to that end that's if you want your life to have a meaning and i spent an awful lot of time in my youth where my life didn't have a meaning and i was perfectly fine with that hmm. how did you escape from that superstitious perspective well by by, by diving into it really um i I bought into a lot of deceptive media because I mean, they, they, you don't have people vetting things on TV. It's like, I, like I thought, you know, they wouldn't be saying this stuff on TV if it wasn't true. No, they say all kinds of stupid shit on TV all the time and nobody vets any of it. So you have to be very careful. So uh, everybody believed in spirit photography. Everybody believed that there was some kind of scientific evidence for telekinesis or for astral projections or that we had souls or whatever that telepathy was a thing all of these so i thought there was some substance to that like everybody else believed and and the way that i thought that i would find out more about it myself was by in uh, was by uh, uh practicing transcendental meditation and doing astral projection and that sort of thing so i got with people who were who were into that sort of thing uh, a druidic, uh, I, I don't want to say priest. Uh, I, I, I don't know what what his category was, but I mean, a shaman. Uh, yeah, basically. Uh, and and and, and the, besides the druid, there was this, there was this other girl that was into TM and and warning about how dangerous it is. But she seemed to be really good at it. So I'm I'm with these people and I'm exploring this. Uh, I'm doing seances and and all, all of this kind of meditation and all of this, and uh, we were able to have a number of profound spiritual experiences more dramatic than I ever heard from Christians. You know the the stuff that I would regularly experience or had experienced multiple times is always a, a better story than what the Christians were telling me. So I figured I'm on the right track. But it was figuring out how auto-deceptive faith is. And I didn't realize I was using faith. The New Age spiritual woo merchants will tell you to, uh, to you have to practice to see, to let your uh, let to let yourself see just beyond what your eyes can physically see. So you, when you phrase it that way, and and you're and you're into you're into that kind of woo stuff. And by the way, I, I was not into drugs, so that had nothing to do with anything ever. Mm. Uh, when I tried marijuana, somebody laced it with PCP, and so here I am, a you know, fourteen year old, fourteen fifteen year old boy, stoned out of his mind for a couple of days, and I'm like, nope, not not getting I'm not getting on that roller coaster again. <laughs> was horrible <laughs> with all that woo stuff i was gonna say I, I visited once um pearl street in boulder colorado and it which is like the new age capital of the world i think and as a christian i was down and it did seem so s demonic and weird and like it just blew my mind that people were into it but it, it really is it's like another any other religion it'll it'll suck you in and if you are convinced 
that becomes your worldview. So I wanted to have firsthand experience of the supernatural. I thought it was real. I thought there was evidence of it. But everything at the time, you know, it was I, it was always stuff that was the, the scientific evidence was always somehow unapproachable, untestable. It was always something that was happening in Tibet. It was always something that was on the other side of the Iron Curtain or whatever. There was always some limitation. So the only way to really test anything was through your own spiritual experience. So d d direct practice, that was the only way to do it. And so I tried. And I got to experience all these things. And the interesting thing was, is that this was a great way to pick up girls at the time too, late seventies, early eighties. Um, and I was, I, I was able to, to, to get people to, to see, hear, feel just and otherwise experience whatever they already believed. If I met somebody who was into Krishna and I did know people who were into that, um, I could get them to see exactly what, what you know, the, Krishna. I can get a, I could get a a a, a bhakti Hindu to see Krishna, or I can get a Christian to to in some way spirit experience the Christian Holy Spirit or whatever. But I couldn't do the reverse. It has to be whatever they already believe. And if it's and if it's whatever they already believe, all you got to do is set the appropriate ambiance. It's all about charisma and ambiance. So if mm -hmm. if I have an appeal to that person and what I'm saying and 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 the way that they feel about me, plus whether it's drums, candles, sitar music, incense, whatever the fuck is appropriate for that that belief system, just let them set the stage prepare them to have an experience let their imagination go and they'll have that fucking experience you just you started the motor put it in gear sit back and watch it run away but when people are seeing gods i don't believe in like i i, I know a guy or i knew a guy years ago i haven't seen him in years but there was a guy that uh there were friends of mine and uh, he he worshipped Bast, the Egyptian cat-headed goddess Bast, hmm. because she appeared to him. She manifested in his house physically. She was tangible, visible, audible. She just appears in his house, speaks to him, and tells him to become her disciple, which, of course, he does, because when a beautiful topless woman with a cat's head shows up in your house and starts talking to you and says worship me that well, you do <laughs> that's amazing but, but the thing is is if if these people are experiencing these things and they're encountering dragons and shit and, and gods i don't believe in and i'm I, I have to do with setting the stage for that then i'm thinking I'm not showing them anything. I'm not, my goal was to reveal to them this other world and what they're seeing is not real. And so I realize if if um if 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 Christian you can't have somebody meet Bast or or meet Krishna or experience and by the way they they meet their gods. It's not like, you know, it's not Christians don't ever have Jesus walk in and there's Jesus standing there talking. That doesn't happen. Krishna will show up personally and start having a two-way conversation with you. The same thing with other pagan, with, with pagan gods. They ju they'll just show up and start talking to you. But with Jesus, no, no, no. You, 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 at best, you get a Holy Spirit kind of a thing. That's why the, the, the pagan experiences are always better. Do you think a lot of that is is by drugs or something like that or no no i i was uh, i was terrified of drugs so i mean do you think I, the people I, that I, claim they're seeing krishna how do you think they're seeing him it's pure faith hmm. so i wouldn't let anybody if, if they were if they're working with me i couldn't i, I wouldn't have people getting stoned in the house i could because my experience with pcp just let me completely paranoid of it. I'm I don't I can't even smell weed without starting getting weird. You know, like I gotta get out and find fresh air or whatever. 
and kept me out of a lot of midnight movies in the late 70s. But I'm realizing that I don't believe in Bast. I don't believe in Krishna. I don't I don't believe in Jesus. And even, even though it's not, it doesn't matter what I believe, these three gods cannot really exist. These are mutually exclusive religions, right? So Krishna claims to be the source of all the gods. He's the creator of the multiverse. I knew that because I'd read this stuff. I'd read the Bhagavad Gita. Um, and, and so you can't have Krishna and Christ. And if you had either one of those, you can't have Bast. So you, you you can't have any of the of the the pagan gods. So these 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 are mutually exclusive. They can't all be real at the same time. So regardless whether whether I believe just logically, they can't all be the same. So these people are not having genuine experiences. This is their imagination. And all I'm doing is setting the stage to the to get them to run away with their imagination. And when I realized that, I started thinking about the things that I personally had experienced. And I'm thinking, if I'm just fooling them through their faith, I wonder if it's possible that I'm fooling myself. And when I started evaluating the things that I could do, and what, and 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 I don't want to get into all of the all of that stuff, but I realized once I once I critically examined my own position, it was a moment. It was only a moment for me to realize, oh fuck. <laughs> Shit that I was the spiritual experiences and aptitudes and everything that I would commonly brag about, I suddenly saw through my own spiel mm. and realized I none of this is real. And I've I have I've had dramatic effects that I couldn't explain that I held on to for years and years and years. And then uh when I I started investigating all these other things that I believed in, and I would find out that there's no substance. To, to this, to that, to the, you know, the, the Loch Ness Monster. Oh, well, it turns out that, you know, some guy's deathbed confession, he put a plastic toy on top of a plastic submarine and put it out in the lake and took this picture. And it's a big hoax. It's the most famous Bigfoot picture. The most famous Sasquatch video. Well, somebody dressed up in a furry suit and had this guy. And then, and then I got to see the documentary of that guy who's admitting that that's him. Right. And so we, we have all of these things turn out to be frauds and hoaxes or, when you find out what Atlantis is based on, all of all of those, this, you know, it, it it turns out there's not some ancient tome that has all these details in it. No, it's a single passage, and it doesn't say any of that shit. It's just all of that was embellishment, and all of it was obviously misunderstood. And when I when I see that there's no substance to any of it, one by one, everything falls down. And the final story for me was was spirit photography. That was. That was the thing that I based all of my my religious belief on, uh, curly and photography, as they called it, and it was a it was a science documentary in the nineteen seventies. It was hosted by Leonard Nimoy, which was frustrating to me because I was a twelve year old boy, and for whatever reason, in the nineteen seventies, everything Leonard Nimoy said sounded logical. So, they have this thing where you have a leaf and you put it between these two photoelectric plates. And then when you run the charge, it kind of takes a picture. It doesn't look like a photograph, a regular photograph. It gives you like the electrical charge kind of thing. So you can see the entire, not just outline of the leaf, but all of the veins in the leaf and everything. And then they're all drawn out as tiny phosphorescent blue sparks. If that, it, it's a difficult thing to envision, but I mean, it's, it's a different kind of thing than a visual photograph. Now that, that part is real. What I didn't know at the time was the bullshit aspect, the thing they did next. So then they cut the leaf in half and take a picture of it again. And at first, you see only the half of the leaf that you would expect to see. But on an overexposure, you would see the whole leaf fade in. And that, to me, if you're doing this with a recently cut leaf, that was proof, scientific proof, of life force of a spiritual energy that was occupying living things right that's right that you would think that's scientific proof right yeah i'm watching it on tv fucking leonard nimoy it's a science documentary in search of was the name of the show and so when i get the internet around about y2k late late 90s you know 97 or thereabouts 
I start to wondering, well, what have they done in the last 20 years with curly in photography? There, surely there must be some great advances. So now that I'm on the internet, let me just Google that and see what I get. And almost immediately, I happen across an interview with Leonard Nimoy talking about that old show, wherein he admitted that it was all bullshit made up for entertainment. Mm. All of it. All of it was just hype. Well, there was no truth so to any of that. So that that was the last thing. All I had after that was my personal experiences, my rather traumatic personal experiences that I don't like to talk about now, even though I was so proud of it back then. There was a time when I would just like I would go into detail about how about these, you know, these vivid experiences. I don't even want to discuss it anymore. Mm. But some of them were shared experiences. So through the power of the internet, I'm able to find people that I haven't spoken to since 1981. And, you know, I identified two of them, the two most important people that I needed to find. They were the ones that shared these experiences with me. Because now I remember these things happening. And I don't, I don't have an explanation for how they happened because it's really looking like they didn't happen. But I remember them. So I'm going to talk to the other people that were there. Neither of them remembered these experiences the way I did. And worse than that, they didn't remember them at all. Mm. It's not It's not that I remembered it incorrectly. It's not, no, that's not the way it went down. No, that didn't fucking happen at all. What do I do with that? Both of those people, those spiritual people, my spiritual guides at the time, by Y2K, 20 years later, both of them, hardcore rationalist atheists, don't believe in shit. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. When you so, got to that point, did you, you obviously would have heard at least, you know, some messages of, of an afterlife and, and heaven potentially on yeah. the Mormon side, even if they weren't into the, the hellfire side of it, but did you like cringe thinking i wonder if that's it like when we die we go nowhere or how did you deal with the afterlife question i had a concept of reincarnation because mm -hmm. uh, my my belief was that that uh, that and I'm, I'm i'm really embarrassed about this because when i started the history of science i realized that this idea that i held on to was was from the 17th century this was george stahl and his concept of vitalism uh, that that uh, physical bodies were animated, brought to life by a, by mixing with the ethereal, astral, spiritual plane, if you will. So that the way I looked at it was, we have clay. Clay is only malleable when it's wet, when it's infused with water, right? Well, that's what makes it soft and fluid and movable. But then, when the water evaporates out of the clay, it's dead. It's dust to dust right and what happened to the the water that made it animate well no the, the water is now evaporated out it's gone back into the hydrosphere i have exactly that analogy for how spirituality leaves the physical body so ashes to ashes dust to dust and the the, the spirit goes back to the spirit world I mean, in very similar fashion so that you become one with everything so that's because I was I, I studied an awful lot of Eastern the Western religions just bored the fuck out of me. So I went East and I, I found, you know, Hinduism was uh, mildly interesting for a moment and then get into Buddhism. And as I said, Taoism, which was I, I, I thought was much more appealing. So I had this idea that you have a, a glass of water that represents you. And you, let's say you pour that out into a lake or an ocean. You're just sitting in a boat. You pour out you. So this is your death. Immediately, quick as you want to, you can put that cup back in the water, right where you, right where you poured you out, scoop it back up. You're not going to get you. It's not going to be, you're going to get some of you if you do it quickly, but it's not going to be all you. It's not going to be all of you. 
and it's not going to be all you. You're going to get, you're going to get the 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 past life of mosquitoes and algae and earthworms and and bacteria and pomegranates and <laughs> everything else, just little bits because you know the water the water you drink has gone through the bodies of dinosaurs and trilobites and everything else for billions of years. So this is why we never have a clear memory of our past lives. Such is my thought. And I wasn't limiting to this system. If we're talking about something that, that only supernatural things can, can do uh, space bending kind of travel then when then we maybe we have other star systems then we have infinite possibilities for past lives we could have lived a zillion times in different bodies and different environments had completely different experiences and the only thing that sucks about that is that you don't remember them so that they can't be cumulative because imagine what kind of a being you could be if you could accumulate all of that life experience such was my thought so it was it was like reincarnation, but not entirely. It wouldn't be that you come back as a cow. It would be that, you know, 28% of you, max, would come back as a cow mixed with a bunch of other things. You don't, at this point, though, subscribe to any of that? Is that correct? No, there is. Uh, I, when I... I was very embarrassed when I I, I took a, a biology course in college intended for science majors, and they get into the intricate specifics of ATP and how synapses work and all of it. When I and I'm looking at this, going, there's no need for a spiritual anything to animate this stuff. This is all entirely just chemicals. This is chemical reactions. That's all. It's very complex chemical. You know, biochemistry is extremely complex, which is also indicative of, of it being a haphazard uh, collection because an intelligent designer would not fuck around with such ridiculous Rube Goldberg mechanisms as this. This only happens because it, it incrementally assembled accidentally. That's the only reason it would ever be this complex and this inefficient at the same time. An intelligent designer would have made something smooth, efficient, and with with not quite so many moving parts. Mm -hmm. I remember looking just at at how chloroplast operates. I'm like, what moron would <laughs> would design something like this? <laughs> this is somebody off his meds who would come up with a pattern like this. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so there's I've I've since come to understand that. There is no, I mean, not just not just belief. By the way, I've spoken to neuroscientists, neurophilosophers, neurosurgeons. There is no soul. There's no support for mind-body dualism. It's not just that there's no evidence for it. It's that there's substantial evidence against it. We don't have souls, just straight out. Hmm. And that wouldn't. I mean, that's going to have a huge impact on uh, mo most modern religions. But if you if you think back to it, uh, early days of Christianity, they didn't believe in a soul that would separate from the body. The, you, they thought you had a reanimated body. It's just like Islam still is. What they're talking about, the, the last day, reanimated, resubstantiated corpses coming back to life and going under repair to become young and strong again. But it's your physical body where you still have to eat and drink and all of that. And you and heaven is in the dome of the sky, but it's a physical sky, and it's your physical body. It's not spiritual. It's not a soul. Mm -hmm. And this is the way Christians used to be. They they used to think that they were going to resubstantiate, and either I, either they have a uh, an aspect of themselves that, that remains dead underground in Sheol. The, the Jewish concept, or uh, and and even even with the Greeks, you know, we, we, there, most of us are just dead in the land of the dead. We're dead. We're, we're we have we have a being of some sort that that is that's there, but it's dead. Hmm. 
And so they started integrating this other thing. They didn't know that that uh, air was particulate matter. They certainly didn't know how chemistry worked at all. But they knew that you would die if you couldn't breathe. So they got this. They got this impression that you're you have a life force inside you. That the movement of air was the spirit. It's the breath of life. And so when you get into the etymology of a lot of things having to do with spirit, you realize that that all of this. The root of the word always relates back to breathing. So uh, the reason that we think we have a supernatural soul inside us is because we didn't know what it means to breathe. So in one translation, when Jesus gives up the ghost, in another translation, he breathes his last. That's all that meant, that the, the breath of life has gone out of him. Mm. He's given up the ghost. They're the same thing. So it's literally all that belief in souls, hot air. Yeah, exactly. Literally. As, as is the whole religion. Um, I, know, <laughs> we're, I know we're short on time, but I do want to throw one final question at you for today. And I would yeah. love to have you back, you know, to talk through some other topics. When you look at people who have been neck deep in this, where it was their whole world, and they truly believed in every sense this this Jesus character was their friend. He was their savior. They expected to live forever with him. They felt like they their whole identity was with him. He bought them with a price. They were God's slave, God's servant, gladly, voluntarily. And they just, they loved it. They loved their Jesus. They I like to talk about the Stockholm Syndrome. They loved their captor. And then they, like I did and, and other people, we realized it's not real. One of the things that happens an awful lot in these cases is people begin to peel back the layers of this, you know, whether it's in a professional counseling setting or just thinking about it, watching videos, and they realize there's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of like this thing, even, even once you say, I admit it's mythology and it was never real, it still has affected your psyche. It's affected your morality. So people might, for example you know, years later realize, oh, my sexuality didn't, doesn't have to be the way that Christians said it could be. I could think outside the box with this or all kinds of other things. Their morality changes, their whole reason for being changes. They're certainly dealing with nihilism now for the first time. And in the midst of it, and, and importantly, I just want to add yeah, something. Yeah, it's not that they're, it's not that they're now allowed to be immoral. It's that they realized that what they were calling moral before what they were calling values before was really just prejudice oppressing other yes. people. Yes. And so they were less moral then than they are now. Yeah. Great point. Great point. And, and as they've realized that all this is changing, they truly feel wounded by, you know, certainly their, their parents, their parents, their parents, their teachers, their preachers. But in some ways, you know, if you, if you, in, in my opinion, arguably, if you let this continue into adulthood, eventually you need to take on some culpability. You you could have investigated more. You chose not to, like myself. I did not ask the right questions. And you eventually kind of become responsible for the fact that you kept on going. You perpetuated it. So you feel everyone else wounded you, but you wounded yourself. You just feel very lost and traumatized by this whole thing. And you feel like you just need to heal and figure out who in the world am I now, apart from this worldview. For people like that, I know it's it's a little bit difficult because your you know your your worldview is so different in some ways. You didn't get sucked into it, but but from your perspective as someone that was more able to see through the garbage so early, which is awesome. What would you say to people who are at that point where they're like, "This is crazy. Like I just I don't even know where to start. My life feels so turned upside down." And maybe in addition to that. They're getting shunning or, you know, at least other Christians saying you're, you're ridiculous. You know, you're a fool for walking away from God in that mix. What would you say to people that are just trying to say, I just want to get back to square one. I don't even, I don't even see myself as like some amazing atheist, you know, smart person. I just see myself as someone who's just trying to climb out of this pit and get to get to the ground level. Now I need to start. What do you say to people like that? They're just trying to heal. Well, I remember when I came out of it thinking, I'm I'm in my mid thirties, and I believed. You heard what I believed. Nobody else believed that. Now, at least with the Christians, I mean, like 
you know, everybody ever, everybody else in Texas or Oklahoma all believes the same stupid shit, right? At least you've got that support group. Who did I have? I wasn't in Los Angeles anymore. It wasn't the sixties anymore or the seventies or whatever. You know, it, here, here I am now approaching Y2K and realizing I'm I'm completely alone in this. I could but I could begin to explain what I believed, and everybody would tell. Well, you just need Jesus. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> where, where, where do you even begin? Um, I was embarrassed at where I came from. I know Seth Andrews, uh, who runs the Thinking Atheist channel, often says that you know that he is not the Thinking Atheist. When he came up with that name, he wasn't describing himself as the Thinking Atheist. He says. I'm the guy who was 35 before I realized that snakes can't talk. So I, I love the way that he put that. Uh, people have, it's both an advantage and a detriment that they have like this huge support base of everybody unquestioningly believing around them because at least they feel like they were justified in what they used to believe. I wasn't. I didn't have a need to believe i didn't need a relationship um didn't particularly want one either i mean i just i just wanted to know what is you know i, I want to understand things the way they really are I, I i didn't want to make believe something whether it was true or not and i remember wrestling with that when i was about 12 when i when i realized that you know i would be, i would be given all of these books that uh, that talked about pseudoscience nonsense you know, you know zachariah sitch and stuff uh um um not l ron hubbard but what was it um uh what is it uh there was a bunch of stuff that was popular in, in the 70s that's you know nazca lines and uh, ancient aliens and and all that all that kind of crap and and i would read an awful lot of the pseudoscience junk and realize that if you read history books if you read science books they don't mention any of these things ever. Well, why why do can I have all these other books that talk about this stuff that you're never going to find in a mainstream book? And so I, I thought, well, I could just read the stuff that I know will reinforce what I want to believe. And then as soon as I had that thought, the instant I thunk it, I realized how dishonest that would be. So... If if it is that you can only get this information from certain books and they're only from people who have no accreditation, there's like there's nothing that they can verify, and they not all the mainstreams of the, yeah, we don't talk about those for reasons. Well, then uh, maybe I need to be more skeptical because it's I, I need to be honest, and that I think is the big difference with faith. Mm -hmm. I can't speak to the emotional need part because I I just never had that. Yeah. Do you do you feel like when you when you do see someone finally escaping that there's something in you that just cheers is like it's about time you all showed up? Where have you been this all this time? Like because it, it feels like it feels like you know, when you finally escape, you're like, I'm finally where i I'm free. Like my mind is free for the first time in my life. Like, why couldn't I have had this? And a lot of people struggle with that question of like all this lost time. But as uh, I mentioned, I've, I've seen people in my family, no kidding, grown adults. When I make a point in one of my, and I, I'm talking when I'm a, when I was a teenager, that the one woman in my family just dropped down to her knees, eyes closed, fingers plugged into her ears, going yeah 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 yeah, because she she could not allow herself to understand what I'm explaining to her, mm. because we can't do logic here. Because we want to make believe. We need to believe this, even if it's not true. And a number of people have admitted this to me, that they know it's not true, but they're going to believe it anyway. Mm. So that, that's the thing that mystifies me. And these are the people that fingers in their ears. Up, no, no, no. I'm going to believe what I want to. But why, why does it have to be true before I believe it? Why can't I believe what I want to believe? I've heard that many times. I've heard something similar in a in the backward sense where people have said, if this isn't true, I don't know if I've got a reason to live. And it just it it blows them out. I'm like, if if a blood magic human sacrifice death cult isn't reality, you have no reason <laughs> to live. Like that's the best you can come up with. Anyway. Yeah. Matter of fact, but, I'm working on a video for that today. Okay. Yeah. Our new speaker of the house, 
who says that mass shootings are caused by teaching evolution hmm. and the the bullshit explanation that he gives for that I, I i just need i need to deal with that ridiculous mindset that if this absurd fantasy isn't true then i should go out and kill people hmm. and I've, I've heard that many times too that if they didn't have fear of god they would just go out murdering randomly which yeah. we know doesn't really happen when when you when you lose your god belief you become a better person but these people want us to believe that all of these extreme right wing religious conservatives who are still definitely religious conservatives when they're murdering people that somehow that that's because of evolution it's crazy I, yeah. I, I would love on that note to uh, at some point bring you back if you're open to it to uh, <laughs> chat on Christian nationalism. Oh, yes. That's a big, that's a big deal. <laughs> Be, before we wrap up, could you just give a quick 30 second plug for your YouTube channel? What can people expect if they come and, and if they don't already? Hopefully they're already well subscribed. But if they are, if that, that one person that hasn't subscribed yet, what are they going to find? Well, I, I, I am on the board of directors for American Atheists. Uh, my my primary goal is to uh, is to to get people to think critically and scientifically, analytically, but but we're also all about secularism versus Christian nationalism. Uh, nobody's a better defender of the First Amendment and of freedom of religion than atheists, because we need freedom of religion in order to be allowed to live. Mm -hmm. So we will defend your right to believe because it means our right not to. Yeah, well said. I love too just all your stuff work on evolution and uh, science is great. Oh, great but stuff. I should throw out this is. This is my full time gig, and it's my only way of making money. So, and I don't make a lot, so I need all the help I can get. So, do check out patreon.com forward slash A R O N R A. I need all the help I can get. Awesome. Awesome. Well, everyone, please do go like and subscribe and support Aaron. Aaron, thank you so much. Great to finally get to meet you. You've been a hero of mine from a distance for a long time. So, I'm very privileged to finally meet you face to face, so to speak, over the computer. But, um, Hopefully I can get to one of these conventions I keep seeing and actually get to shake your hand in person. But thank you for what you've been doing. Uh, we really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aaron.